Welcome everyone to our latest episode of Bookmarked, a program that aims to help you find your next great read. Uh, my name is Jessica. I'm a librarian here at Chelmsford Library, and this is my colleague, Deanna. And we're both very involved in Reader's Advisory at the Chelmsford Library. Uh, today, our focus is actually gonna be our ongoing winter read bigger challenge. Uh, if you have not had a chance to pick up a bingo card yet, there is still time to participate before March 7th. Uh, you can either pick one up in the library or at curbside or visit our website and download one for yourself. All you need is one bingo to be entered into the prize drawing. But of course, we hope you will take the opportunity to explore, explore many more of the categories on the card. We have displays and lists all over the library and online um, to help you make your selection. So today we have each brought with us a selection of books uh, that we recommend you try to um, accommodate the categories on the card. Um, and so I'm going to hand it over to Deanna to get us started with uh, the first book that she brought with her today. Oh, thanks, Jess. So there are a lot of great categories to choose from on the bingo card. Um, if you follow our reading room blog, you know that I'm only a few spots away from a bingo myself. Um, I can't win a prize, but I can't resist a good bingo game. So, but for this show, I decided, like Jess said, to kind of, you know, expand past just that one uh, bingo grid um, and chose a few other random squares. This first I chose was a book by a contemporary Black author. And there, there's so many uh, great authors to choose from. To be honest, I was, I was a little overwhelmed by it all. So in the end, I fell back on what I love to read, which is mysteries. And I chose Walter Mosley, who's a contemporary Black writer of the mystery genre. And I confess, um, is a big gap in my reading. Somebody I've always meant to read, so I've used this as the perfect opportunity to do so. And the book I chose was Devil in a Blue Dress, which is the first in the Easy Rollins series. Um, this book is set in the late 1940s. Uh, Ezekiel Easy Rollins uh, is a Black veteran who has made his way to Los Angeles after his war service. Um, he's just been laid off from his factory job and he's worrying about how he's going to pay his bills. And a friend introduces him to a white gangster named DeWitt Albright. Albright is looking for a woman named Daphne, Daphne Monet and he gives Easy the chance to earn some money if he can find her. And if you guess that Daphne is the devil in the blue dress, uh, you wouldn't be wrong. Um, Easy soon finds himself way over his head uh, and not knowing who he can trust. I think uh, Mosley does a really good job of capturing the times. You know, Easy lives in a, a black neighborhood where everybody knows everybody else and everybody knows everybody else's business. Um, and he has a, a really great way of capturing the way that people speak and the way that they speak to each other. Um, and he also captures the relationship between the Black community and the police at that time. You know, Easy knows that if they want to pin a uh, crime on him, there's really, there's nothing that he can do about it. Um, he's, a, he's a tough guy, he's a tough veteran, but you can really feel his fear when he's being questioned by the police, knowing that his toughness is not going to save him from prejudice. Um, one reviewer wrote about Mosley's work, uh, Easy's finely calibrated understanding of the commentary uh, on social and racial climate around him gives the novel its defining texture and power. So these are more than just mysteries, but a way to understand how the past affects the present, um, you know, as written by a master of the mystery craft. Oh, yeah, I've, I've heard so many great things about Walter Mosley. Um, but you said this was the first in a series? It is. Um, so it's the first in the Easy Rollins series. Um, and you can definitely tell that he's writing this character for the long term. You know, he's introducing the characters, he's setting the stage, um, you know, for the neighborhood that he is, you know, at one point he finishes questioning somebody and, you know, he feels really good about himself and very clever. And he says, you know, I think I could be a detective if I wanted to be. So, you know, definitely. Um, and he's in it for the long run. And it has been a long run. Uh, the 15th book, in the series Blood Grove is due out shortly. Yeah, yeah, it's been long anticipated, I think. Um, so it sounds like, going back to what you were saying before, it sounds like Los Angeles is almost a character in itself. It is, you know, the Los Angeles in the 1940s is definitely a big part of the book. Um, and in some respects, I feel like, you know, this kind of lends it an aspect of historical fiction in that you're, you're getting a feel for the culture and the society and the times of the 1940s in this case, as seen through the eyes of a Black man. And I think if you, if you like mysteries that have strong lead characters and a strong sense of place, I think you would like this series. So if you like 
James Lee Burke, you know, whose novels are set in uh, New Orleans, Elmore Leonard for Detroit, uh, Robert B. Parker, Boston, um, or even Michael Connolly with a contemporary take on um, Los Angeles. I think that you would like Walter Mosley. Fantastic. Sounds great. Um, my first book is a reimagined fairy tale and, and a fantasy novel. So that's two categories in one book, if you read this one. <laughs> um, it's Spinning Silver by Naomi Novik. Um, it's a lush and imaginative take on the tale of Rumpelstiltskin that drops the anti-Semitic implications of the original and picks up a more modern feminist storyline set in an imaginary medieval Eastern European landscape. Uh, Miriam, our main character, our first main character, is the oldest daughter of a Jewish family whose patriarch, though he is a moneylender, is far too compassionate to go around and collect the debts of the people he lent money to. So it's kind of a problem. I mean, compassion is great, of course, but in this case, it leads the family to the brink of starvation. Finally, Miriam has had enough and she steps up and takes over the operation, keeping meticulous logs and cleverly devising ways to reclaim what's owned owed from the villagers who have been allowed to take advantage of her father's generosity for so long. Uh, one of these visitors is a poor farmer with three children. And when Miriam goes to claim the debt from him, she sees that he has nothing to offer but his daughter, who Miriam decides will work off her father's debt as Miriam's collector. The daughter, Wanda, becomes completely devoted to Miriam's service and, of course, ends up being paid for her services in other ways um, as Wanda's home life, as Wanda's own home life is filled with abuse and sadness and Miriam's family, is compassionate, as compassionate as they are, feed and respect her. Miriam begins to do very well in the business um, and attracts the unfortunate notice of the Staric, a fairy-like community that exists in a parallel kingdom and are obsessed with gold and also control the winters. Uh, one Staric lord in particular puts Miriam through three tests to change bags of enchanted silver coins into gold. Uh, Miriam does this for the Staric by taking the silver to a jeweler in the city who melts the silver down to create beautiful silver jewelry that can be sold for gold pieces to wealthy gentry. These pieces connect us to the third major character, Irina, a half staric maiden whose father, a duke, is purchasing the charm jewelry to bolster his less competitive daughter, Irina's marriage dowry. Ultimately, Irina is put up for the, con uh, for the contested Tsar, a half magical being himself, born of a witch that gained the status of Tsarina through trickery and murder. Um, the Tsar ostensibly has no desire for Arena other than her star connection. She's actually half steric herself, so she's a half uh, magical creature. But Arena finds a way to escape every night um, that keeps her safe from the demon that haunts her husband. Well, that sounds that sounds really interesting. You said you know um, fairy tale retold, which I, I kind of you know really like that concept. So how does how does the tale of Rumpelstiltskin like fit into this narrative? So just a quick gloss of Rumpelstiltskin. I mean, um, a miller's daughter is uh, held captive um, and is told to take a huge, huge piles of straw and weave it into gold. She, of course, she can't do that. Um, so an imp visits her at, at the eve at, um, in the evenings and agrees to do the, um, to weave the straw into gold for her in return for whatever plenty pieces she has on her at the time. Eventually she runs out of nice jewelry to, to give him in return and um, agrees to give him her firstborn once she's on, once she's released. And when he comes back to claim the firstborn once she's had her first child, she did she won't do it. And he says, so he agrees, okay, if you um, if you can guess my name, then you can keep your child. Um, and she follows him into the woods and spies on him and hears him saying his name over and over. And therefore she defeats him by learning his name. Um, so in this one though, it's really the three, the three challenges that are, that are most echoed um, from that tale. Uh, the steric Lord steals Miriam to make him his wife and goes to, and, um, to make him his wife and they go back to the kingdom. And when she crosses over to this magical realm, uh, she actually has the power not just to sell the pieces for gold, but actually to just touch the piece of silver and transform it into gold. And so he keeps he keeps making her do this. Um, and in or if she wants to escape, um, he she in return for it, he he makes her do this 
in order to um, shorten the winters again and bring back the spring and bring back the, the fertile crops. Um, so she agrees to transform three huge storerooms of gold um, and manages to accomplish this task, um, though she does it in a very smart way. So we have the three in the mortal world where she's been given the bags of gold, or the bags of silver to transform into gold. And then three more in the magical realm, the steric realm, uh, where she has to transform the silver into gold. Oh, yeah, that, so, you know, that makes me think about the, the one of the aspects of kind of fantasy and science fiction is world building. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not set in a world that we know. So, you know, how did the author kind of make you comfortable in this world that she's making up? Yeah, so she, it's really, really dense descriptions. And it's, you know, you kind of build the picture in your head, especially of this winter kingdom with its glistening glass walls and its, um, you know, the way that, even the way that the characters move through the world is described vividly. The lush, um, the lush clothing that they wear, the grand ballrooms of the Tsar's palace, um, the, everything is described very, very well. And it's very, um, and I, and, you know, it's almost as if they can, she, she makes it really easy for us to wrap our minds around the imaginary lands she creates through her precise description. And she's using all kinds of, it's not just like the physical world that she's describing, she's bringing in echoes of folklore from that entire region. So she's really either really heavily researched this or she's, uh, she's just very well versed in it. Um, so yeah. really enjoyable. Yeah, that sounds really, really great. And it kind of, kind of flows into to my next book. Um, slightly because the other the other category I chose was climate fiction and that's an offshoot of speculative fiction which also has a very big um, world building element to it often in speculative fiction um, but the book that I chose um, is Weather by Jenny Offill and you know climate fiction books tend to be you know kind of about the environment about climate change um, they can branch into things like global pandemics though frankly nobody wants to read about global pandemic <laughs> at the moment um, but you know they can so they can take place in a world we know or they can take place you know kind of in a speculative future in which things have usually gone horribly awry right um, I know you read a lot uh, in this genre. Um, I'm a relative newcomer. You know, I've read books like Station Eleven, uh, The Stand, uh, The Passage by Justin Cronin. So anyway, like I said, I chose Weather by Jenny um, Otho, um on your recommendation. So I can tell you, so it's a book about a young woman named Lizzie Benson. Uh, she lives in Brooklyn. She has a husband and a son. She has a job as a librarian at a college library. Uh, she does a side gig for her old mentor, answering email generated from a radio show about climate change. And she has a brother who's a recovering addict who she worries about a lot. But otherwise, I mean, this book is kind of hard to describe, right? It's told in, in fragments. It's told in fragments of Lizzie's life uh, and her thoughts. And it's set kind of amongst kind of the every, everyday task of living your life. Um, but underlying all of that kind of is this worry about climate change, uh, which is more and more upon us. You know, this book is set uh, in very contemporary times. So, you know, over the course of the novel, you know, her worry only increases about the current world and the world that she's leaving for her son. Um, she worries, you know, what can one person do in the face of such a huge problem? Um, and as we kind of see her rising anxiety, you know, we wonder along with her, like, you know, how do we balance of intellectually and emotionally, like living our lives amidst, you know, such a large and seemingly impossible issue as, as climate change. Um, a New York Times review uh, kind of gave a, a better description of kind of what she's attempting here. Um, they said, the scale of its ambition, despite its brevity, is its attempt to tell a story about climate change that carries the same visceral force as our own private emotional dramas that is, in fact, inseparable from them. Um, so, you know, it's the type of book that, that benefits from thinking about it after you finish it. You know, it's a, it's a quick read. And so sometimes when you read something quickly, you, you equate that with a lightweight read. But, you know, that is really far from the truth here. Um, in the end, you know, there's a lot, there's a message, you know, of, of mindfulness, you know, of activism. You know, um, one of my favorite things was that her, her husband, Lizzie's husband, Ben, he's posted a reminder above his desk 
you are not a disinterested bystander. Exert yourself. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, it sounds it sounds a little bleak. Is that is that the case? Well, you know, I thought so too at first, but you know, as I was thinking about it, you know, and I was thinking about you know, kind of this message of mindfulness and activism, you know, I think it's really like highly relatable for the times that we are living in. You know, Lizzie is just an ordinary woman, you know, trying to live her life, you know, but worrying about, you know, the impact of things on the wider world. And I think that's a feeling like we can all understand, um, you know, and there's an overall message of hope in the story. You know, she says, the core delusion is that I am here and you are there, you know, so in other words, you know, we're, we're not alone in this. We are in it together. We're in it together, exactly. Great. Uh, and so, besides climate, people who already like climate fiction, like myself, who might pick this up, um, who else might like this story? Yeah, I think you know, if you've read any climate fiction, you would definitely get a lot out of the story. Um, as for other books and authors, if you like literary fiction, just in general, I think that you would really appreciate you know the style and format of this book, and just in general of of Offil's writing. Um, if you like authors like, I don't know, Elizabeth Strout, uh, Ann Tyler, Marilyn Robinson, I think that you would really appreciate Jenny Offill. Oh, great. Yeah, those are all really popular authors. Um, okay, my next one is also concerned with nature and the natural world. Um, it's called, but it's a historical fiction. So this one is for your historical fiction about a real person category. And this is maybe a lesser known person. So I found it really intriguing. Um, it's called Remarkable Creatures by Tracy Chevalier. Um, and it has a much more concentrated storyline than my previous, the, the other one that I shared, um, but similarly world building in that it's concerned with a very specific time when scientific discovery and confirmation of evolution of different species of the earth was first being equally challenged and explored. Science was beginning to get a foothold in this area and formulate real evidence. Uh, the story begins with Elizabeth Philpott. Um, she's being shipped off with her spinster sisters to a place on the coast of England in the late 17th century, or late 17th, early 18th century when her only brother is married. Uh, fortunately for Elizabeth, she ends up on the coast that happens to have a wealth of fossils in Lyme where they end up. Elizabeth begins a friendship with Mary Anning, a local town girl who has been collecting the different fossils and selling them for her family. Mary seems to have a natural ability to find the fossils prevalent on the coast and Elizabeth, a woman of middle class and educated, is able to help Mary understand the identity and value of what she's seeking and learn to ask questions. This becomes especially valuable as the special discoveries increase the volume of people traveling to the coast, especially to find fossils for themselves. One of the things I found really distressing about the novel is that Mary never really got credit for her work as a hunter. Um, may a major barrier to her success, or maybe, uh, and, and it's possible you could call this either just her big heart, her compassion uh, for other people, um, but mostly it's the fact that a series of men take advantage of the young woman. Um, particularly as she moves into adulthood. It's atrocious really. And I would argue that the author is imparting an agenda here, um, but they do take full advantage, paying her so much attention, gaining her affection. And then once they have their fossil, they ship off back to London and win a claim in the geology and natural science circles, mostly men at this time, of course. Um, eventually though, due, in, uh, due in to Elizabeth's brave intervention, you might call it brave, there's a scene where she has to walk down the streets of London by herself and she's terrified, you know, because women just didn't do that um, in order to go to the geological society and confront, use her connections as, as sort of a, a, a middle range, uh, middle class, um, use her connections to confront uh, those who are taking advantage of Mary and, and win her acclaim. Yeah, that sounds really great. You know, I mean, I think, one of the things about reading you know, historical fiction, especially set in that time, is kind of the battles that women had to fight, right? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. You know, um, you know, so what other things? Like, so, you know, there's society, there, you know, there's the, the male figures, uh, the church, mm -hmm. like things like that. Yeah, the church was definitely a, a second major barrier that kept coming up, especially in a small village like Lyme, where, you know, that's their main source of society, so social interaction and entertainment and education. Um, unfortunately, their church still held very 
strongly to, or certain sects of the church still held very strongly to the idea that um, the earth was only maybe like a thousand years old and that God had really created all of the creatures to, in all of the creatures to live forever on the earth. Um, so not really a, a agreeing to the idea that any creature went extinct or that these fossils were from creatures that no longer exist. Um, so that was a very, that was very confusing, especially for Mary um, and, and, and Elizabeth, who, who both of whom were trying to figure out exactly what these fossils yeah. were. Um, so that was an interesting, interesting uh, part of it. Yeah. And did you learn anything else about like just their lives in general? You know, did either one of them ever get married? Did they continue to, to look for fossils or? Yeah, I mean, it, it ends very it ends very vaguely in that sense. Um, I mean, Mary is really, or Elizabeth is really beyond the age at that time where she could hope to land a husband. Um, and, and Mary obviously has an interest in it. Uh, she's younger, she, she's a younger woman. Um, she obviously has an interest in it, but it doesn't seem to pan out too well for her. And each time these men kind of run away, her heart gets broken. So you'll have to read and find out exactly how it all comes out. But um, but ultimately, I can say they find peace. Oh, good. Yeah. And isn't this, am I thinking of the right thing, that this is a, a new movie with Kate Winslet? It is, yeah. It's called yeah. Ammonite, which is the name of the uh, one of the types of fossils that they find all over the beach. Um, and I don't know much about the plot for that one, but it does look slightly different. I think they may have made some changes, but um, mm -hmm. but obviously I haven't seen it yet, so yeah. I don't know. But I do love Kate Winslet. So. Yeah, that looks really good. Yeah, that sounds like a sounds like a really good book. Mm -hmm. It reminded me. I, I think I should say that uh, Mary's passion for the natural world um, and her innocence maybe reminded me a lot of the character of Kaya in Where the Crawdads Sing. Mm. Uh, so if you kind of like that story, you might like this one. So now we're going to move into our lightning round and uh, the first um, and this is just we've just brought a selection of books that we're just going to share with you that we're excited about that we maybe haven't completely finished yet but um, we think you should read and the first of my picks is The Bad Muslim Discount by Sayed Masood um, and this is my suggestion for a book to fill the category of the own voices category the book by an author of a different religion or ethnicity or life experience than uh, the reader, possibly. Um, Sayed Masood was born in Karachi, Pakistan, and now lives in America, and his novel addresses the issues around assimilation for different Muslim communities. But if you think you're getting a didactic tome of literary fiction, you would be wrong. While it tells a heavy story at times, it still manages to be sharp a sharp-tongued satire, and at times laugh, it loud, laugh out loud funny to read. Our main character, Anbar, is the quote unquote bad Muslim of the title. His family has moved to California to escape the intensifying fundamentalism in their home country of Pakistan, but are still holding firmly to their Muslim practices, all except for Anbar, who is committed to rebelling against his family's beliefs, belief system. He finds his way out and to university to study literature and then politics. And it is from him that we get some of the riest observations in the novel. Meanwhile, Safwa, a young girl in Baghdad, is barely surviving and having lost her mother after having lost her mother to cancer and a father to kidnapping and is left to care for her terminally ill brother. She makes it out with her father, now brutally angry at Safwa for having abandoned her ill brother in order to escape a life-threatening situation. The two end up in California, and this is where Anvar and Safwa meet and begin to learn how to come to terms with their split identities in America. Again, it is what once funny and poignant and should definitely be on your list for our show. Oh, that sounds really, that sounds great. My first book is Who is Maud Dixon by Alexandra Andrews. Um, the book is told from the point of view of Florence Darrow. She's a 20-something living in New York, working at a small publishing house, dreaming of becoming a writer. Um, her mother has instilled in her this feeling that she's destined for big things. Um, so she's very frustrated that those big things are not happening for her. Um, she's offered a job as an assistant to an author named Maude Dixon. But the catch is, is she's going to have to sign a non-disclosure agreement uh, because nobody knows the real identity of this author. 
which turns out to be a woman named Helen Wilcox who lives in upstate New York. So, you know, Florence uh, travels to upstate New York. She's soon, she's living in her guest house and she's trying to impress her new boss and, you know, do the, the research for her new book. Um, and then Helen tells her that they're going to take a trip to Marrakesh uh, to research for this new book. And then once they're there, uh, Florence wakes up in a hospital room and she doesn't know how she got there and she doesn't know why everybody thinks that she is Helen. Um, so you're gonna have to read to find out what happens uh, next. Um, but it, it very much reminded me of another book that I told you about on a previous episode, The Talented Miss Farwell, and that you know, you're kind of pulled along in the wake of Florence's decisions, sometimes very bad decisions, um, and you just keep wondering, like, how is this all going to end? Um, so this book is due out in March, uh, Who is Maud Dixon by Alexandra Andrews. Oh, intriguing, absolutely. Mm. My final selection um, is Of Woman and Salt by Gabriela Garcia. And this would be my pick to fill the category of a Latin American author. Um, this is the daughter of uh, the Gabriela Garcia, the author is the daughter of immigrants from Cuba and Mexico, and this heritage informs her focus in this novel. Uh, the story begins in Cuba in 1866 on the plantations and among cigar rollers where the seeds of rebellion are being sown through readings of Marx and Victor Hugo, among other articles that are leaking through. Here, a lineage of women begins, um, begins with the daughter of Maria Isabel. Flash forward to 2014, there's quite a leap, uh, where we meet Jeanette, the youngest generation of this line, a recovering addict and daughter of Carmen, one of the first wave of Cuban immigrants, a more well-off class on the surface, but Carmen has family secrets to reveal. When we meet Jeanette, she's watching her neighbor being taken away at night by ICE officers. Um, that's Immigration and Customs Enforcement and watches the house the next day when a young girl returns home to an empty house. Jeanette takes the girl in for a short time, but ultimately turns her over to authorities. This begins the other, the other um, parallel story of Gloria, the woman who was taken away, and the girl's mother, um, and the immigration crisis in general. Uh, Garcia's writing is masterful, and her lyric prose, lyrical prose is engaging. I was swept along by the stories of the struggle of each of, the, each of these generations faced. These stories should absolutely be read by everyone. My last book is If I Disappear by Eliza Jane Brazier. And we learn right away that Sarah, who's the main character, is a very troubled woman. Um, she stays mostly in her house, uh, listening to her favorite true crime podcast over and over and over again, kind of obsessing about these stories of women who disappear. Um, when the podcast abruptly goes quiet, uh, she worries that the host, Rachel Bard, has gone missing herself. And kind of in her, her state, she decides that she is the one who is destined to find her. Um, so she heads to, to Rachel's home, um, which is a rundown, kind of off the grid style camp that her family runs. She gets a job as a horse handler there and she starts asking questions about Rachel. And Sarah soon finds that the camp is very odd. Um, the, and Rachel's family is even odder. Uh, and she is convinced that they are hiding something. Um, and then, you know, Sarah, she's a very unreliable narrator, but like in a different twist, kind of an interesting way. And in that it's very clear, like from the very first page that she's got some mental issues um, kind of stemming from events in her life, you know, that she hasn't dealt with. Right. And so, you know, it's when you as you're reading, it's really hard to tell like what's real and what's her delusion, like as far as this obsession with finding uh, Rachel. So um, I would recommend this one for sure. If I Disappear by Eliza Jane Brazier is actually just hitting the library now. Ah, great. So lots of lots of great books there for your uh, spring reading um, and for your winter challenge um, mm -hmm. reading. Uh, we do have, uh, visit our website, uh, www.chelmsford.org, sign up for our newsletter. We have a new reader newsletter with just news about what we're doing and some great author events. And also check out our blog where Deanna just recently shared three other picks. So you can read about those. Totally, totally different picks. There's so many. Um, so we hope you enjoyed our show and thank you for joining us. Bye everyone. <laughs>